today's Sandy Speaks is going to focus directly on my white people. What I need you to understand is that being a black person in America is very, very hard. I will light you up. Get out. Wow. Now. Sandy called me. Let me know that she had been arrested. How do you go from failure to signal a lane change? To dead in jail by alleged suicide. I believe she let them know. I'll see you guys in court. And I believe they silenced her. Do I think this jail have anything to do with her death? No. But moral responsibility was absolutely. If we want change, we can truly make it happen. Sandy Speaks. So we have with us today one of the directors of the film, David Alrunner. Hey, y'all. And also on this panel, we have Gregory Boyens, a criminal justice sophomore. <laughs> Marcella Thomas, senior communications major. <laughs> and Professor Teresa Dowell Best, instructor in languages and communication. Thank you. 
Would you tell us something about your creative process and how you balance the serious nature of this film? Yeah, I mean, I, I, the creative process was I, I lived it with the family. Um, they were <coughs> incredibly open. Once we got past the initial phase of who the heck we all were, and then, um, so the first part was just living it, you know, uh, the ups and downs, the insults slung by Waller County against Andy's character, the, the frustrations of trying to pull facts, accurate facts, out of the Waller County officials who had sort of circled the wagons. Um, and then the other part was you wanted to tell a story that would pull it all together, that would inter that would tell it would profile Sandy. So you left the film not feeling entirely just like so this is a police procedural, which is, is important, but you also felt like you got to know somebody. You know, and I hope that everybody who saw the film got to feel like they know a good bit about Sandy Bland and who she was. Um, and putting all those pieces together, you know, that was that was really was exciting and amazing. And the family is so cool. I mean, how many people go let a film team come in and play film them playing Bruno Mars, you know, while they're grieving. They were, they were, they're, they're as awesome in person as they are on camera. They're, they're just great. So that was the other part was, I got to know these people who I, I just love now. And I, I think we're, we're all really set. Like we're, we really got close. So that, those, those are what helped artistically keep me in balance. How long did the project take? Project took, uh, from the day we started shooting, about three years. Um, where does this film rank in your reservoir of work? Um, I think my wife, who can't be here, by the way, who is my partner in everything, and she, this is entirely her work as much as it's mine, so I'm just happy to be answering the question. Just got to say that way. Go home and tell me. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I know it's good for my marriage, it's lasted a long time, so <laughs> we're planning to keep it up. Um, I think in a way this is really the culmination of a lot of the work that we've done our whole lives. In many ways I think it's the quote best film we've made. Um, I mean I think it, it flows in a way and, and, and the, the other ones it's just kind of built on it. And, and visually I'm really proud of it. I think there's a lot of camera work and artistry and storytelling and we tried to put some humor into it to keep this from being just so sad and heavy. So you know they're, they're really, it's really important to, to brighten up the story from time to time. So I, I, I think it's our, our, our best work. Um, we just, during it, we made another film called Traffic Stop, which uh, was, took place in Austin, which is also the story of an African-American woman sent over by a police officer. But it was a short film, just 30 minutes. It was almost like a poem. Uh, and that film got nominated for an Academy Award, which was the first for us. We went to the Oscars, and we did that one. Um, but this one, I think, is a more sophisticated film. It's a work of journalism, a little bit of a profile, poetry in there. Yeah, that's, that's, I, mean, I'm, I can't be a victim. What effect do you hope that the film um, I hope everybody in the world sees it. Uh, uh, but the reason I want people to see it is, is because I think we're in an incredibly um, polarized time in our country right now. The nature of dialogue uh, is, a, is at a real low ebb in my experience. Um, and Sandy had this great, beautiful, hopeful message of let's listen to each other. Let's be self-critical and also analytic or empathetic about people on the other side of the race divide. Um, you know, I don't know if it was accident or not that Sandy's family picked up. There were a lot of people who wanted to make the film, and not all of them were white by a, by a long shot. And, and it's been a really interesting experience for us. It's been eye-opening cross the racial barrier on, on both sides of this. Um, and so I hope people come out of it going that we can't just have knee-jerk reactions to things. We need to look closer, we need to look more deeply into people's motivations, because just by calling someone a racist, you end up like stopping the dialogue. And right now, this is not a time when we can afford to be doing that. This stuff shouldn't be happening at all. And it's a lot of it because people Police officers in particular are not talking about their own racial biases and triggers. Uh, they think, like Officer Insinia probably would say to you, I'm not a racist, you know, I have black friends, we, we hang out. But he clearly was triggered by an, 
dealing with an empowered, with what rape and gender in that case, an empowered African American woman. That really got him out of joint. And it triggered something in him, even if he's not conscious of it. So everybody has to look deep in the mirror. And I hope this film encourages that kind of awareness, because then we can get to work. We have the Sandra Bland Act in Texas, which addresses how we handle persons who present with some sort of mental distress coming into jail facilities. What else do you perceive that we need to do at this point? I mean, the big next step, which was, as you saw in the closing um, card of the film, is police de-escalation. You know, um, that was removed from the bill. It was promised to the family during the settlement that there would be police de-escalation training using this dash cam to, to an example of how not to relate to people on the street. Yeah, that, that is not done. You know, you get, you get awards in the police department for daring arrests and stuff like that. Nobody gets an award for de-escalating. You know, well, what happened on your shift? Well, I talked two or three people down and I'm, I'm done. Did you arrest anybody? No. You know, you should, get, you should get an award that day. You know, you avoided trouble. You kept somebody from, from blowing up. And that mentality needs to be instilled in officers rather than just making collars, dominating people. I mean, as a former prosecutor, I dealt with that mentality a lot. And it's, it's very hard to break through. But I think we have to start somewhere. Okay. Um, we've had a subsequent law requiring <coughs> training. I don't know the content of the training. We'll see how it how it goes. Requiring training for law enforcement and interactions with the public, and for high schoolers before they get their driver's license, learning about interactions with law enforcement. So we'll see. Texas is working out the details of what these uh, training exercises. Uh, to hear some more reactions from the panel, uh, uh, Mr. Bowens. I'm not sure if you guys can hear me. Um, but my reaction to the film, um, it actually opened my eyes because coming to Prairie View, I'm from Blue Grill, Texas. Um, it's a very diverse city. Um, it's 20 minutes away from Austin. And I say that this film really opened my eyes because I heard about the situation. I mean, I've seen it on social media but I didn't know all of the facts. Um, and I'm not saying that the film provided all of the facts because there are facts still missing. Um, but it did really open my eyes as a student um, and as well as a male, uh, African-American male, um, on how to go about uh, situations when getting pulled over or just um, having interaction with the law. Well, I'm Michelle Thomas um, from Beaumont, Texas. to embody what this means for me. Like, I'm a young African-American woman in this country. And um, it's like, it's like the, um, the thing that people always say, you never know like what it is, or you never understand that it could happen to you until it happens to you. I mean, we're at Prairie View. This happened to me at Prairie View. Um, so, I'm connected to it deeply, first of all, because I'm here. Second of all, well, first of all, because I'm a black woman, and I know that I, it can happen to me at any moment. Mm -hmm. Second of all, it's because I'm here. And since I'm here, that means that I have the power in myself to take a stand, take a stand against you know, injustice um, for all people, but especially for African Americans. <laughs> Um, first of all, thank you all for coming to the screening today, and thank you, David, for sharing with us um, this amazing film and the research and the, the care that you've given this topic. Um, this, this past summer, um, Marsh Marshayla directed um, two PSAs that Dr. Susan Kawasi, uh, Freddie Kawasi, and myself produced. Uh, with the Texas Department of Public Safety, which is a part of the training that you mentioned before, where um, the, the hope is to give resources to new and young uh, drivers in Texas, um, 
hopefully a template, some guidance, um, and, and what we can do to, um, what, what, what we can do in the event of a traffic stop. The complicated part of, of that is it's, it's not just the drive. Right. So it's like, you know, how much of this is us preaching to the choir, but we wanted to do our part to save ourselves in a sense. Um, in a world that gladly arrests white men with guns and kill unarmed people of color for changing lanes without a signal. Um, the irony of it, both Dr. Kwasi and myself, two days after we finished filming those, were both pulled over by police. I was pulled over here on campus, and Dr. Kowasi was pulled over by Hillary. Mm -hmm. By the very people we filmed over the course of that time. And I was, I remember sitting and following, I, 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 my brain caught on fire when I saw the lights behind me because in the videos, in both videos, we shot to where there were instructions on what to do during a daytime pullover and instructions on what to do during a nighttime pullover. My pullover, we had just wrapped. And then, so it was about 10, 11 o'clock at night. And I saw the, I stopped at the stop sign and uh, pulled on through where the football stadium is. And just as I pulled through the stop sign, the lights came on. And I was like, oh, really? Okay, well, okay, let me think about the video. <laughs> and so I put my hands on the 10 and 2, and I waited for the cop to come up. And I recognized the cop as, as she was walking up. I recognized her as being one of the extras from the court scene where we shot. And she pulled up and she went through the procedure and I'm thinking, oh, this is very professional. She's, she's going by the card and, and, and by the instructions of doing it. And then I realized she didn't recognize me as being someone I had just engaged with her not an hour prior. And she said, well, do you know why I pulled you over? I said, sorry, I have no idea. She said, well, you stopped on the line instead of behind the line. And I felt everything I learned in preparation for the video, go out the window. <laughs> All I felt was a sense of, um, I, I was angry, I was scared, I was confused, I stopped at, completely at the stop, and yet that wasn't enough. And yet it was still enough to, and, and with, with Dr. Kowasi, um, she stopped at the stop sign, but she hadn't come to it. She did a California roll, as we call it. <laughs> where she stopped and she was like, I, I felt like I stopped. And she said, I might have kept going. She pulled into the parking lot right here outside of Juvenile Justice. And the guy um, who was the cop during the nighttime shoot, I was like, yeah, he got on the thing and said, ma'am, get stay in your car, da, 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 and just kind of berated her from outside of her car. And it just shook her to her core. And it, she called me and we, I came over and we talked for a while. And um, I think what, even beyond laws, are a sense of humanity that's missing in the training of law enforcement. Um, because I didn't feel protected. I didn't feel at ease. And I, <laughs> I, 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 for lack of better terms, I feel like I abide by the rules of, and, and, and policies of respectability. And I just wanted to cuss her out. <laughs> just, so I think if we are looking at what we, how we can move forward from this, and perhaps David, you could speak more to this because you were in the trenches gathering her story. I mean, what, did you see any evidence of a, sh a shift in humanity or a shift in, um, I know the sheriff at the end was like, you know, perhaps we should have done things differently or better um, in, in checking on her. Um, the fact that no one ever brought up the fact that she checked yes, that she had been suicidal, but she had no business ever being alone. Even if there was no trash can. Like if there was nothing there, she still had no business being alone. Did you see any evidence of a shift or growth in humanity and that experience? Uh, you know, for, before I say anything, I gotta say one thing, because as I hear you talking, how, how much it means to me to be here at Prairie View, I just wanna thank you for having us here, having our film here, because we filmed a lot on your campus, and I was having all these flashbacks as I was coming up, driving up here, and I'm looking at the film and all, all these locations I've been to, and um, you know, I, I, Sandy is looking down on it, and I think she'd be incredibly moved that her voice could still be heard here. And 
Um, it's funny. Um, yeah, you, humanity. Um, <coughs> I didn't see much from the prosecutor. El Elton Mathis, I think, was a little chilly, to be perfectly honest. I don't think he ever really took to heart that this was a three-dimensional human being. I, I just there's something about him, and I, I, I think he meant well, but I never felt that from him. Sheriff Smith, I agree. I, something happened to him where he shifted, and I talked to him, and he said, more responsibility-wise, you know, I will always think we could have done something different. But I, I think overall there is a sense that in, in these jails and arrests and these sort of criminal justice mills, and unfortunately the grit for these mills is young African Americans. People are used to see it and they just grind them through the system and you're just next and you're a number immediately, you're not a human being. You know, we, I've shown this film in quite a number of public settings. Uh, we've shown it in particular two very large settings, uh, one in Chicago, where Sandy was from, another major screening we had, you know, five, six hundred people was St. Louis. And we do, I do a lot of Q and A's and there are white and black people in the audience. And inevitably black people say, yes, this happened to me. So many, I've heard it so many times, it's just not at all funny. I have never <coughs> heard one white person say this happened to me. And I find that just an, an, an appalling reflection on the state of criminal justice in the United States. Why is this still going on? You know, I, I, and I think people have a lot of thinking to do about that, about the humanity of, of other people who maybe, maybe look different than you, but are, you know, it's one citizen, one vote. You know, we're supposed to be equal. So it, it's, you know, I, I'm, it, it's this frustration you hear in me. That's what got me up every morning for three years to tell a story. You said that you, there was a lot of competition for other filmmakers. Um, <coughs> it was the family's decision to go with you and your wife and produce a new film with you. And I don't know if you can possibly know the answer to what I'm about to ask you, but do you feel like perhaps you became more granted access to the worldwide demand mm -hmm. in a way that would or would not have? I, yeah. I, I, I think I was pretty surprised at how much from the law enforcement side, we were able to get the, the voice in my head was like, I wonder how much of this was a result of the access. Yeah, well, you know, there's no doubt I come in with a little privilege that probably comes from being a white male in American society, but I, I have this relationship with HBO and I've won all these fancy awards. And, and so I'm coming in with a lot of um, firepower uh, behind me when I, when I approach anybody. You know, I'm, I'm aware that I have won, you know, been, won all these fancy awards and I have HBO. To, to, to offer you, so you're, I'm not, you're not just going to be spending a lot of time making a film that nobody sees. But, you know, I, I really opened my heart to, to, to Canon and Geneva and, and Chantal and Sharon and, and, and Pierre and Siobhan right, right from the get-go. Um, and and I've, also, I've talked to Canon about this a lot in the family. <coughs> what do I say to people who ask us that question? And I, you know, I, and Canon says, have them come talk to me. <laughs> so give them a call. Uh, they're, and you're right, they're a better place to answer that question than I am. You know, I, but I, I do try to really, like, I really care about this stuff. I, I really, really am in the fight. And, and uh, they, 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 they're, these guys are nobody's fool. They're incredibly smart. And, and you can see how articulate and thoughtful they are. And, um, you know, I they, they, they took a hard look. And we've gotten really close since then. We are, we are very, they've been texting me all, all during the screen. And they're really excited about it. Okay, are we ready with questions from the audience? Okay, a couple more minutes. So, uh, talk about your background as a prosecutor in, in this project, and the transition of your film. You know, I was, a, I was a prosecutor back during uh, World War One, or so. It, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> but I mean, so it was a long time. Uh, Twenty-five years ago or so. But um, uh, and I left, and I wrote a book about it called Rough Justice. If you ever want to go to the library, I hate it. it's called Rough Justice, and it tells you why I joined and quit the job because I was really frustrated about how the system is really basically a factory, and it's not based upon the same kind of humanity I hoped would be 
<coughs> exhibited by the law enforcement here. Um, and, and so, I'm sorry, the second part of the question is the transition to filming. Yeah. Well, transition to filming is that I wanted, I wanted to reach people. And, and film, is, film is the most ubiquitous and powerful medium of our era. I used to write books that used to be the ubiquitous and powerful medium. That is no longer the case. So that, that's one. What would a Sandy's piece be today? What do you think? And this is for David and the panelists. <coughs> today, a Sandy's piece. If she were speaking to us today, based on the streaming and what's happened in the past few years, what do you think she might be saying to us? I personally feel like she would be she would be telling us um, to not hold in what we think um, as an individual, no matter what color we are, um, because our voice does need to be heard. Um, <coughs> as well as to go about um, situations the way you feel like is most important to you. Um, and I say that too because most most African American males and females are taught to, you know. Don't argue with the police. Don't do this. Don't do that. There's a time and a place for that, I feel like. Um, but as an African American male and female, our voices have not been heard for so long. Um, and so I feel like, yes, we should follow those rules of waiting until it gets to like the court um, or a safe place. And some people think behind the wheel is a safe place. But as we can see, that's not, that's not it. Um, so I feel like she would just be telling us to watch our surroundings, uh, wait, not necessarily wait, but um, make sure your voice is being heard. Um, if Sandy was still here, um, she would definitely be saying the same thing. Um, the exact same thing. And it's kind of like a, a, it's happy, but sad and devastating at the same time. Like she knew the, the power and the courage it took to be this strong, independent black woman to lead generations. Um, so that's, that's the happiness of it. The sad part is like, we still have to talk about this. It's still relevant, still highly relevant today. Um, so I think if she was still alive, she would be saying the exact same thing that she was saying on the video. I think, uh, I, I would be tickled and curious uh, to see what she would think about the, the time we live in now with the current administration. And, um, I think Sandy speaks what can amplify, quite frankly. I, I think it, we live in a time where um, she sets an example of what we can make of social media, film, television, um, books. Still, uh, you know, the hate you give, uh, you know, a, a New York best selling book um, communicating the need to return to humanity, right? Um, now being made into a film. So I think hashtag Sandy Speaks should continue to live on because um, she, she's the Maya Angelou of our time, in a sense, on a, on a political level on a socio-political level, and um, she is still with us. She's, she is still with us. And, just, and a, a comment worth, worth making is that if she had not died in prison, the very likely scenario would be that she would have been convicted of assaulting Officer Trooper Insania, because it was his word against hers, it happens off camera, and she might be doing time for a felon. Yeah. And we would never, none of us, would be talking about Sandra Bland at all. And she would be one more forgotten statistic. And I've spoken about that reality with her family. And it's a very, very important thing to bear in mind. There's so many people who get just sucked into the criminal justice system and they don't come out intact. Mm -hmm. um, and you never hear about them again. Weirdly, it took Sandy's death to give her a voice. Yeah, about her voice. Mm -hmm. Related to that, would you add something about the title, Save Her? Anything more you want to add about that particular title? Well, I mean, 
think her name was not, um, was a rallying cry already in use throughout the country. Um, and um, it just seemed like Sandy's story, she was the woman, she was the one name with like a hot button name. You mention her anywhere and, and talk to, you know, white and black. I, I'd go to these like all white cocktail parties like Martha's Vineyard, you know, and people, they, Sandra Bland, you know, they, they knew that story. They, they were, people were mesmerizing, wanting to solve it. And so that it struck me as that she's the case that embodies the whole thing in the movement. She actually is a name you, you should say, you can say, people know what you're talking about. And then the subtitle, The Life and Death of Sandra Bland, it was The Life. Really wanted to make that clear in, in communicating, you know, titles are really a way to tell people what the movie's about. And the life, and this really is, I mean, half of the film is her life. And, and, and that was really important to Katie and me. Okay. All right, I have a question here from the audience. What advice would you give to someone who wants to create a document? You know, go go find a regular job. Um, <laughs> do it. Actually, no. Whatever. What, what, my my advice really is just do it. Um, it. The beauty of the documentary world now, compared to when I started, is that cameras are really cheap. Editing systems are really cheap. Everybody can get one pretty much. You can borrow. You can do it. On, I I shot some of that with an iPhone. Okay. Um, you know, all those autopsy scenes were with, with literally the very phone I had in my pocket, and maybe you can blow them up to be that big, and they still look pretty good. So you know. You should never use as an excuse, ah, uh, it's too, I don't have the gear. You, know, you, you can get the gear, it's pretty cheap. And then so you just go do it. And, and it's amazingly democratic in, in, in the basic way. You put together a film, <coughs> you know, maybe it's, you can't get it into Sundance, because it is, you know, Sundance is theoretically democratic, but it's, there's a bit of a club there. But there's a lot, a lot of film festivals out there, and they want cool new work. There's an amazing film called Minding the Gap that just came out of Sundance, actually, about this kid who was filming he, him and his skateboard buddies since he was 14, he's now 24. Took all the film he did for 10 years, and it's it's such a beautiful film, and you know, go look it up. Minding the Gap, it will, it will, it will blow you away. So, you know, just go do it. Don't wait for money to come in. You know, just keep, keep body and soul together and make some money wherever you can in a regular job. And if you're really lucky, you know, somebody will buy your movie and then you can quit your regular job. <laughs> I, would quit, I would not quit your regular job first. <laughs> okay. Another question. How did the film make you feel while shooting? Um, shooting is a weird place to be because you're doing a very technical job. You're looking at the light, framing, and sound, an airplane flies overhead, you gotta say, stop, sorry, you're, you know, please stop telling me your most intimate secrets and wait till the airplane stops flying over it. Uh, so it's just, it's hard, it's just exhausting. I mean, that's really how it is. I'm thinking of the film and I'm trying to also keep a rapport going with the people you're with and by the end of the day, you're just, you're just exhausted. It's, it's, it's just hard, uh, hard, hard to talk about. Another question, apart from de-escalation training, do you think frequent psychological assessment should be a part of what uh, persons that the do? Anyone? I've been doing a lot of talking. Come on, you guys. <laughs> well, I, I, I think this actually is a question that speaks to you know some of the research you, you found as a result of engaging these in with law enforcement and yeah. talking about the escalation. Um, I will say this regarding film and maybe accountability as, as it connects to de-escalation. Um, it seems like it's still not enough to ask police officers to wear body cams or have dash cams. Um, you know, everything that looks like we're trying to grasp at for accountability still seems to work against the citizen, works for law enforcement. Allowing law enforcement to, to, you know, be acquitted of charges and that sort of thing. Um, how can filmmaking, how can um, documenting more of police activity, how can we use that to contribute to de escalation and, and perhaps even de escalation training from a civilian perspective? I mean, again, we have no law enforcement sitting up here. So we don't, we don't say or speculate, we feel like they should do. 
Um, I mean, it makes us more, it makes us more knowledgeable about what, what goes wrong. And, and it makes people to talk about it, and, and you can pull out your camera and film it if it's <coughs> going wrong. Where would we be, you know, without that guy with the, with the, the bystander cam, you know, who broke the news yeah. before the dash cam? You can't see what's going on outside the view of the dash cam, but you can see him, Asinia, on top or <coughs> on top of Sandra Bland, face down in the dirt. And you might notice she was face down, but all the scars and bruises are on her back. And so there was, there, she was really roughed up. It was, it was, what went on, what went on out there was terrible. Somebody had the presence of mind to film it, and it helped the cause of justice in this case immeasurably. So take, 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 take responsibility for being a citizen and participate, and this will help you do it. The other way documentaries can help though is I did a film <coughs> four years ago called *The New Bird Sting*, which is about four African American Muslims who were lured into. Um, <coughs> But the, the FBI had essentially promised to pay them $250,000 if they would participate in a bombing. And these are one guy was mentally ill, living in a halfway house. Another is, you know, you know a pot dealer out of work. They, these four knuckleheads. And then they, they created this fake case and hired and we gave them fake bombs. And they should never have done it. But but they were not a Muslim terrorist ring. But they they sold this case to Congress and the public as a real terrorist ring. And they had airplanes flying overhead and bomb squads coming to to protect the public from the fake bombs that the FBI themselves supply, okay? So I got all that FBI footage, and I got to play that before the United States Senate, you know? Yeah. So some of that documentary, you can really go right to, you know, the source. And maybe with this film, I will get the Texas legislature. Talk about police de-escalation. Really talk about it. Show them, make them confront it. Um, you know, and that's Sandy's thing. It's like, you know, you gotta get up there and grill sometime. But you know, speaking of your, speaking, I mean, speaking, when you talk about like proper etiquette when you're pulled over, you, know, you look at the, the dash cam though, Sandy's perfect. He pulls her over, license registration, here it is, five minutes past, he comes back, he goes, <laughs> and, he, and he's trying, he's, he's insinuating it, he says, you seem irritated. She doesn't say a thing. And then she says, well, okay, you asked, yeah, yeah, I'm irritated, I don't like what you're doing, but it's your job. And he goes, and she stops, it's silent, and he goes, are you done? You know, like, he's, he's bugging her. And she says, well, you asked what was wrong, so yeah, now I'm done. More silent. Mm -hmm. You know, so he, this is, what do, you, what do you do? And maybe here's a question, when you have an officer who, who is bugging you, like actually needling you. We went through some training for those PSAs um, with the police department here on campus. Um, just conversations with Chief Jensen, who's our campus police chief. Um, and at the time, there was a young lady here on campus who was in a classroom after hours mm -hmm. where it was believed that perhaps she shouldn't have been there or she had permission to be there by her, by her professor, but she didn't have access to her ID. She didn't give up her ID, and the campus was somewhat split on what should have been the way to handle that. Um, when the police officer said, tell me who you are, you know, I need to see your ID. Her response was, I told you who I am, but I don't need to show you the ID, and I'm and it just kind of went back and forth a bit yeah. and to the point where it just escalated out of control. Um, and it was difficult to really say one way or the other who's at fault or you know where does the responsibility rest. Watching that video, I really wish the officer knew more about how to de-escalate because in a way, in a great way, he was the one in charge of the situation. You're, you're, holding, a, you're holding a gun. You have you have um, the ability to, to call up backup. She can't call up backup. I, I like to see that happen, right? Uh, oh, we're not like to see that happen, quite frankly. And looking at um, you know Sandy as she's been pulled over, I ran the process through my mind watching today. You know the only thing I didn't see, and this is more like a technicality that they were, that the police were all pushed upon. They were, you have to turn on your hazards lights because the hazards indicate to me that you're ready for an engagement with me. I'm like, I didn't know that until we went through this training. Those are the sort of things that feels like they're booby trapped in a way. Oh, you know, she didn't quite do it right. Or, oh, you know, she wasn't well within her right to talk about the cigarette or, or, or say no to me in any sort of way. Um, when this when this happened, I was still living in D.C. I hadn't moved here yet. 
And you see the emotional temperature of, um, of this, of Ferguson, Baltimore. Um, we have people in our neighborhood worried that the, the unrest in Baltimore is going to come into D.C. because people were that close. I mean, people are just tired of politics and respectability. People are just tired of being told, what's the proper way to do things, and when you do it, there's still repercussions. Um, it's, it's what the, 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 the reverend said, it's all a product of racism. Let's just do that, first and foremost. Um, and as a body, even black cops, perform the racist duties of this body called the police who are law enforcement for one demographic and protect and serve for another demographic. I don't want to talk about procedures until we deal with what they're doing. Okay, there are a number of questions here about the integrity of evidence that folks are wondering if you have any insights or comments that you'd like to share. Some, uh, there's a question about the form can we say that Sandra actually gave those answers? And there are a number of questions here about the plastic bag. Is it that strong? And I did notice the comment about DNA on the bag. No DNA on the bag. So uh, any general response about the integrity of the evidence in the film? Um, just to start off, I feel like it's kind of weird on how there were African-American <coughs> police officers throughout the scene. Mm -hmm. And if you notice, she checked yes on one, but she checked no on the other. You can't, there's not really a limit on to saying, I, those thoughts don't go through my head anymore. So as an African-American police officer, it's just kind of weird how they didn't check up on her. Um, or make that round or ask those questions um, just to see if they are okay. Because as you can tell, she still shook, she's scared. Um, and she, like, she was crying in the film um, or on the cameras. She had a lot going through her mind at the time, so she could have easily checked yes or no, not really understanding what the question is asking. Um, so I just feel that <coughs> it's weird that nobody took the time out of their day, and you see that they're just sitting there at the desk or they're walking around to even go back there and check up on her throughout that time. But it was easier for them to unlock the door and throw her in there for who, who knows how long. And it's also weird how like they seem to use the, they try to just make excuses for her. It's just like, oh, well, this happened too. Y'all didn't know this happened, so we're gonna run with this. We're gonna focus on this at this point in time. And then we're gonna run up here and focus this. It's like misguiding, misguiding us from the real problem. The real truth of the matter is there's no DNA on the plastic bag. So how is she dead? A question that we do not know the answer to. And out of all things um, that I noticed in the, the film, there, there was a rope <coughs> as well as the shower curtain. Mm -hmm. She could have used that instead of using a plastic bag. So why? Out of all things, it was a plastic bag and there's no DNA on there. Yeah. As well as they said on one of the videos, one of the officers had on gloves. Mm -hmm. Why wasn't he questioned? Why wasn't, why didn't they proceed with those questions? Um, and the knots on the trash bag, they, they weren't that large. So it's, it's like, how, how is she able to do, how was she able to do that? And she claimed that her arm or her hand was hurting at the time. It just, it doesn't make sense. There's missing gaps throughout the story. There's a question here in reference to the comment by Sandra Sorardi's sister about being over-policed. And someone's asking for a reaction from the students. Do you feel over-policed? And do you feel safer with the increased policing? The question. Absolutely not. <laughs> um, absolutely not. And first of all, there's we there's the issue with that we have as a community with police. So to add more police is adding more to the problem that we're not dealing with. Um, and the fact that a lot a lot of know if a lot of students even know that there are like so many um, different police. Uh, 
that, yeah, on campus. I don't even know until they probably watch the film that they'll know that. Um, and you just. Yeah, that Roman Hall was law enforcement in this area was law That was a lot, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I personally feel like, even to this day on the campus, with them adding more police, I feel like it's not necessarily helping because <coughs> that brings in more point of view. Um, and that, that just widens the, the category of excuses out um, as to just limit the amount of police and give them more training, take them through more um, more trainings, more process on how to handle situations with college students instead of bringing in more and thinking that a larger team is going to help the situation. Because the message that's being sent to the students is, oh, we're going to do it. We want to do it regardless of what y'all say. Right. And <laughs> that's not, that's not going to help any. Yeah. Oh, well, I wanted one quick shout out because we talked about over-policing and using your phone and all that. One of the three or four last lines in, in the film, which is really not a laughing matter at all, is the line when um, Reverend Hannah Bonner says, um, you're supposed to protect and serve me. And the guy says, no, I'm not. I don't remember the other like, no, she's like, no. Um, Pat is here, and you should just, you know, get some credit. <laughs> And a great source of incredible um, <coughs> visual material that you would never have gotten on. Oh, sorry. I didn't want to let the evening pass after you passed up. Um, a, a final comment from the panelists before we close things out. Professor? Uh, just thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for, thank you for facilitating this. And thank you, David, for shooting this film. Um, telling her story. Thank you for working with the family and, and bringing so much humanity to um, the details that we did not know. Um, and, and certainly the, uh, just the beauty of this young lady. I, I, it was, I have to say it was difficult to watch the entire film. Yeah. But I, I felt like um, the truth that, that you and your wife shared and offered us um, from an objective, your fingerprints were not there. And, and you want a documentary filmmaker to not impose themselves into the narrative of what they're capturing. And you, you just let the family flourish and tell their story. Um, but it wasn't until the very end which, where this, one of the sisters played Bruno Mars, and I was in public water. And it wasn't so much because, oh my goodness, this is a heart-wrenching thing. You, you, you didn't forget the joy of Sandra and her family, their humor, their love for one another. And I'm just pleased that that was my parting, my parting feeling, my parting heart. Thank you, thank you. Actually, that was really important to put that in there. Yeah. I, I struggled with it a lot because it's, if you think about it, it's a kind of odd thing to put at the end of a, a serious murder, death story, yeah. whatever however you want to characterize it. But um, you had Sandra was such a bright light, and to, to end on a dark note didn't didn't do justice to her, you know. So I'm, I'm glad. Yeah, I, I. Plus, it was really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> but but Bruno was great. He gave it. He, he saw the film and, and was extremely supportive and lowered his rate as low as he could go. But the, 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 but it was an artistic decision for him. I'm glad it worked for you. Um, I I would like to say that thank you for everything that you did. Um, thank you for everything that you cultures um, silence um, and it's it's the heart of racism that and we're not dealing with it and uh, it's always going to be a problem until we decide to be consciously aware as a human being for one um, to speak on issues and speak
focus on um, injustices throughout the world, not just in America, but everywhere we go. Like Sandy uh, said in the video, um, I'm going to continue to speak, um, which is what we all should be marching and trumping for. Um, I just want to thank everybody for coming out. Um, I feel like, you know, you took time out of your day to come watch this documentary. Um, yes, it is sad, sad, but it also opens up eyes of those <coughs> that didn't know certain things that were going on. Um, and I just want to tell everyone, just keep letting your voice be heard, no matter if that's voting, going out and voting, no matter if that's posting a tweet or posting a comment on Facebook, your voice is not too little. Um, and if you do YouTube videos, continue to do those. Somebody out there is watching and, and it's reaching them, no matter if they comment under that saying, you know, thank you. It's touching somebody, so continue to do it. Thank you guys for having me. I, I also got to give a shout out to Sigma Gamma Rho. You guys, <laughs> you guys, uh, all around the country, we serve you Tennessee and Sigma Gamma Rho. You guys are awesome, and, and thank you for support. You, your support has been, I mean, you, you supported Sandy long before there was a movie. I mean, you guys were the ones who got that message out there to begin with. And, you know, I think that that kind of solidarity is going to make changes. So, you know, yeah, please tweet about our film, but when the next injustice comes, keep, you know, keep hollering. Thank you, panelists. And I, I'd like to make some remarks of thanks um, and say that this is quite a tragedy that happened right at our door to one of our very own. And I, I don't think Sandra had a clue that she would keep on speaking, that her videos would continue to live on. I saw the AME fire in her doing those videos. For those who are AME, you know what I'm talking about in terms of marching and standing up for injustice, against injustice. Um, I thank those who had the courage to step out and make sure that we say her name and call attention to this issue. And we've seen other issues nationwide. Uh, Prairie View has a history of producing people who are courageous, who will stand up and speak against injustice. And students, I hope that you continue to pay attention and speak up. We've had students march against Gen 6 and, and tweet and do <coughs> social media. And I hope you continue to use the technology and have the courage, even when it's not popular, to speak up when you see things that are not right. Um, I do have to say thanks to Carol Martin for her work in contacting HBO and bringing this documentary here, Courtney, Roshni, um, definitely Case and David for making the film, for the president's office and the team, Carol Campbell and John, Ms. Lisa, Ms. Stephanie, Sam, all those persons. There are a lot of people who contributed to putting on this program today, and I want to say thank you. And, and as a closeout remark, I'll just say to our students especially, the aim was students, that you will continue to be courageous in speaking out against injustice. And I know the communications department has another program after, so we'll end on this note. Thank you again.